And uh, Molly said this in her little synopsis. She said, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We preached last week on bowing the knee. And this week, I want to go a little bit further. He said, unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom? And he goes on and gives us a little bit more information there. And we'll look at that um, a little further in the rest of the verse. Chapter number 3, verse number 15 of the book of Ephesians this morning, where the Bible said in verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom, verse 15 says, the whole family in heaven and earth is named. I want to preach if I, if I can get there on the whole family today. Amen? The whole family. I know it's not Father's Day, uh, but uh, it's on my heart for just a minute. I want to get to the family, but I don't know if I can get past preaching about the Father this morning. So we're going to look at this verse and just uh, follow it a little bit and find some things. I want to deal with this family. This is where my heart is today. My heart's on the family, not on the, the typical nuclear family as, as we think of, or even today's fragmented family. My heart is on the family of God, the family that makes up the that the church makes up today, that the born-again believers in Jesus Christ, we part, we're part of the family of God. And the Bible speaks of this family in verse number 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. But before I get there, I want to notice in this passage, there is the Father. And He is the Father. He is our Father today. And we want to mention this morning just for a moment about this word Father. There's some unique unique things about this word Father. And I want to just bring that out, but I want to get to the family. But I, I just, so this idea of this word Father, Jesus, the Bible says in verse number 14, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now I want to deal in verse 15 just a moment. My Bible says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now modern translations have taken that word whole and, the, and have said every. Now Greek language allows, in the Greek language that word is translated hundreds of times every. But it's translated here whole. The idea some want to say is this verse speaks of that every time you see a father in a setting, whether it's a, no matter what kind of setting you see, if you see an earthly father, that is a picture of the heavenly father. And I like that. that that's wonderful. Every time you think of the word father and you think about a, a, a father in a, in a setting with children and, and providing and anything in that setting, that does point us to the heavenly father. But that's not what, I don't believe that's exactly what this verse is talking about. I believe He is the Father, and that, and as, as the text says in verse number 15, of whom the whole family, not every family. Now, there, every family is a picture, huh, but yet He said of whom the whole family in heaven. Now, this word is used home. It's important. I, uh, uh, this word whole, it's used several times. The Bible said when Jesus uh, cast out the demons out of the man that the whole herd ran into the ocean. The Bible said the whole city came out to see them. The Bible said the whole creation groaneth for redemption. And here the Bible said the whole family. I believe the Lord is speaking about one family. Amen? I'm glad that, God, that God's children make up one family today. And aren't you glad to know that there's some of them in heaven and some of them on earth but it's all one family today. And if you're here today and you're not part of God's family, I hope today is the day the Holy Ghost deals with your heart and draws you to Him and you become part of the family. The whole family today. The family of God today. And it's in heaven. Some of it's in heaven already. And some of it's still on the earth today. But I'm glad for the whole family. And there's only one source of that family and it's God the Father. He said here about the Father. He said, uh, and I want to speak to you just for a minute. And I, I know it's jumbled. I, I've got so, I've got to find that pathway. And that's what I love. The Lord can do that for me today. And so in Matthew 5, 
verse 16. I just want you to see something about this word father. In Matthew 5, verse 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see you good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Then in Matthew 23, Jesus said, And call no man father upon the earth, for one is your Father which is in heaven. And between that verse in Matthew 5 and that verse in Matthew 23, 21 other times Jesus speaks about the heavenly Father today. Amen. Aren't you glad we have a heavenly Father? And Jesus emphasized it again and again in Matthew's Gospel. He kept speaking of the Father that's in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I've got a God today who is in heaven heaven this morning and some of my family is there with him I'm not talking about the soup family I'm talking about Jesus' family the family of God my friend and some's already in heaven but they're still part of the family they don't quit being part of the family and we don't begin being part of the family when we get there we are now the sons of God we are now the sons of God and so this idea of father and then you turn over to John's gospel and John's Gospel, over a hundred and time, 120 times, Jesus speaks about the Father. It's alright to call our, our Lord Father. He is our Father which art in heaven. But He also said, look, don't call another man Father. Not talking about Daddy, but this idea of putting titles on people, we don't do that. He said, don't call another man Father. He said, because you have a Father, and He's in heaven. Amen? So we don't use that word ta uh, Father in, in a sense of, of a title of a church officer because the Lord told us not to. He said, you've got a Father in heaven. But This idea of this word Father is a very big word. It's very important. Jesus, in John's Gospel, it's mentioned over a hundred times. And then Corinthians says, there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things. There is one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one baptism, one God and Father of all. The Bible calls Him the Father of spirits, the Father of mercies, the Father of lights, and the Father of glory. And my friend, through Jesus Christ, you can be one of His children, but we've got to stop. We've got to stop this idea, this myth, this lie that we're all the children of God. We are all the creation of God. We are all the creation of God. But we are not all the children of God. You have to be born again. You have to be saved to be a child of God. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Yes, He loved us enough that we could be called His son, but He loved us enough to send His Son to die for our sins. We are not born into this world as sons of God. We are born as descendants of Adam and we must be changed. We must be saved. I know Wayne Sosby's not here today. Y'all going to have to fill in the gap, okay? Fill in the gap. Amen? We are not. And this world, how many times do you hear it? Hey, we're all God's children. We're not all God's children. We are God's creation. We are descendants of Adam. And as descendants of Adam, we are cursed. Except for the fact that Jesus saves us. We've got to get that in our mind. We've got to quit letting people think, hey, because you know the first thing is everybody says we're all God's children. And what's the thing that follows that? And all God's children go to heaven. Well, guess what? All God's children do go to heaven. But we're not all God's children just because we've got blood in our veins and breath in our lungs. You have to come to that place where the Lord saves you. Amen. Is it okay to say God saves people? Then acknowledge that. Our children need to hear you say that they've got to be saved. They don't get much when the preacher says it, but when mom and grandma start saying it and it rings in their ear, it gets a hold of their heart. And this is why we're at church today. We're not all just sitting home trying to read this ourselves. We're coming together where the Spirit of God works in different lives and touches singing and touches testimony and touches the preaching and touches the prophesying. Amen? 
I'm not predicting the future, but I am going to try to preach the Word today. That is prophesying. It's okay. It takes the Spirit of God to do it. This idea of Father, he said, he said, I bow my knees unto the Father. Without the Father, this is why it's so important, without the Father, there'd be no family. Amen. Amen. Without the Father, there would be no family. He is the Father of whom the whole family, the whole family in heaven and in earth are named. We're named as part of His family. We're called the family of God. Hallelujah. Amen. The soup family won't get you much. But the, but the family of God has got folks in another world. Amen. There's folks in another world that are part of our family through Jesus Christ. And this idea of Father, it, it, he said there's just but one Father. And as I, as I read to you, He's the Father of mercies, the Father of spirits, the Father of lights. The Father of glory, but He's our Father. That word comes from that word we, we get paternal or paternity from. But now I want you to de deal with an, another word because this is where my heart is. My heart is in this word of family, of whom the whole family. What is a family? This word, by the way, read your whole New Testament all the way through. Start in Matthew, read all the way through the last chapter of Revelation. This is the only place in your entire New Testament you will read the word family. That surprises you, doesn't it? It surprised me. It's only in the Old Testament about a hundred times. But in all the New Testament, the word family is only found one time. And guess where it's found? Ephesians 3. Of whom the whole family. It's the only place the word family is used. Now, it is used, the Greek word, it is used to other places in your, in your New Testament. You know where it's used? Wait, I remember, remember a couple weeks ago I couldn't get past that word, that word lineage because he's the, of the house and lineage of David. That's that word. And then, then there's a place where the Bible said kindred. A kindred. But family in our English is only in our New Testament one time. And you're reading it. What is a family? Let me just read to you what Webster says a family is and see if this can help you. What is a family? The answer to the question, what does family mean, is both difficult to answer and highly subjective. The word has shifted its meaning considerably since it entered our language it current, and currently contains many different senses. And at least in one sense may signify different things to different people. The earliest use of family denoted a group of persons in the service of an individual. <laughs> a group of persons in the service of of an individual. Amen. I'll take that. A group of persons in the service of an individual. Amen. I serve the king. I serve the father. And we're part of a family today if we're serving him today. But you know what? The dictionary, this is Webster's Dictionary. You know what the dictionary says about that definition? It says, it says this. In a sense, that is now archaic. In other words, it says, in a sense... That definition is outdated. Yeah, I, I'll say. But a family is still the, the root definition long before you get bloodlines, long before you get birthright. It is a group of people that are serving the same individual. Amen. Aren't you glad you're a child of the King? Aren't you glad you're part of the family of God? He said, I, I'm praying, I'm praying to God the Father of whom the whole family the whole family in heaven and earth is named, is identified, is set apart. When you're saved, you become part of the family of God. And there's no other way to become part. You can join New Canaan and become part of New Canaan today and be lost. But you cannot become part of the family of God except you are saved. We don't preach church membership. We'd love to have you. Church membership doesn't save you. Church membership doesn't change you. But become part of the family of God. We're translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. But this idea of what is a family. A group of persons, Webster says, of common ancestry. Amen. 
Amen. We've all been born by the same blood. A, a, a group of peoples regarded as divide, de, divide, deriving from a common stock. A group of people united by certain convictions. A group of people united by certain convictions. That's what Webster says of family. Sound like any people you know? It ought to sound like your church family. It ought to sound like the church. Uh, our convictions ought to be the same as somebody else's conviction if we're part of the same family. But we realize many churches do things many different ways. And they all use the Bible as their basis. Or say they do. But I just want you to know that our convictions, the best we understand, come from this Word. They come from this Word. And so, you know what you ought to be able to do? You ought to be able to unplug from here. Now, Lou and Herb were with us just barely a year. And they unplugged from here. And today, hopefully in good health, they're, they're visiting another church. You know what they ought to be able to do? They ought to be able to plug into another church with the same convictions. And they ought not have to miss a gear. They ought to be able to see a man go to the pulpit, pick up the same Bible, preach the same Word, have the anointing of the same Spirit, and sing and praise and follow the Lord. And why? Because that's what a family is. That's what a family is. And you ought to be able... You say, oh, well, they, they may sing these songs, they may sing those songs. Sure, every family's got a... Every household's got a little nuance to it, but it ought to be... The basic tenets ought to be the same wherever you go. This idea of family. What is a family? It's a group of things related by common characteristics. Amen. We look around, and you go to this church, ought to have the same characteristics. You go down the street to another church, ought to have the same characteristics. Ought to love people. Ought to have the same heart. Ought to have the same graciousness. Ought to have the same kindness. Ought to have the same unity. Ought to have those things. Why? Because we're part of the family. The whole family. The whole family. And, and, and the last definition, it said a group of related languages descended from a single ancestral. Amen. When you go to a new church, they ought to speak the same language. Amen. I love that. I love the idea of family. I love the idea they may have a different accent or a dialect, but they ought to speak the same vocabulary. Saved ought to be saved, ought to be saved, ought to be saved no matter where you go. Born again ought to be born again, ought to be born again no matter where you go. Sanctified, justified, redeemed, my friend. Those are the words of our vocabulary, and they ought to be able to be spoken anywhere you go. They ought to mean the same thing. That's what the, fa the whole family. I'm going somewhere. I I'm getting there. We we we'll get there. Let me say a little bit more about this idea of family. But Encyclopedia Britannica or Dictionary Britannica says this, at its best, the family performs various valuable functions for its members. Watch this. Perhaps the most important of all, it provides for emotional and psych psychological security, particularly through the warmth, love, and companionship that living together generates. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to talk to you about, what the, the, about the church for just a minute. We are, by our, by our charter, by our first article of our decorum, we are a group of baptized believers. Baptized believers. That's what we are. If you're a member of New Canaan Baptist Church, according to the rules that they set in 1976, January the 13th, you must be a baptized believer. That's what you have to be, to be a member of this church. That, that's it. You have to be a believer in Jesus Christ, and you need to be baptized. That's what membership requires. And so if somebody comes along and says, I want to join the church and become part of that church family, we simply ask them, have you been saved? Why? Because we don't want to make it easier for somebody to miss going to heaven by thinking they're okay with the church. But today we see a big change in our lives and in our society. It doesn't matter about heaven. We just want you to be fit in real good here. Listen, being ready for heaven sometimes you may not fit in. In other places. 
But we've got to make sure, folks, and we, we, we're not able to judge. We don't, we don't put a light over you. It doesn't turn green if you're telling the truth and red if you're not. And, and some people think they are. They just don't know. But by your testimony, you've been born again. You've been saved. And you're a candidate to be a member of the church. But then have you done the one thing God told us to do after we're saved? Have you been baptized? Have you been baptized? No, I, I just never got baptized. Well, we encourage you to follow the biblical example of baptism. Those are the things that we would ask of somebody. Why? Because you're going to become part of the family of New Canaan. Now, I'm still, I'm still headed somewhere. Family. As I told you, the only, the only time it's used in the entire New Testament, you'll never find the English word family but one time in your New Testament. And the Bible said, the whole family. I'm just loving that word, the whole family. The whole family. In heaven and in earth. Some of our families already in heaven. Some of the soups are already in heaven. But uh, uh, all the soups may not have got to heaven. I don't know. But all of God's family that's went on has went to be in heaven. Aren't you glad? He didn't say they're in the heart of the earth. He didn't even say they're in paradise. He said they're in heaven. Why do you say that? Because we believe after Jesus died and spent those days, then the Bible, we believe the Bible said when He went, he took, the, he took the church with Him. And no longer are they in paradise, but they're in that place called heaven. That's what we believe from our Scriptures. But listen, the Bible said they're not, in, they're not in the center of the earth. They're not in paradise. They're not in limbo. They're not in the grave. They're in heaven. Amen. I'm glad we're going to heaven one day. And we're going to be with the family when we go. We're not going to be there uh, floating around in space. We're going to be with the family and the Father. Now, Here's what I want you to get today. Here's, here's my big burden. This is really why I, I dealt with some of Molly's thoughts last week and I just couldn't get by uh, as from a few weeks ago, this household of God. And, and I, I, want to, I, I, want to, I want to deal with this idea of being saved, but I, I, I've, got to, I've got to speak to this for just a minute. The Bible says you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Galatians said we're of the household of faith. I told you we've got we've got we've got the we've got the, 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 the we've got the father, we've got the family, and the Bible says for us, if we're part of the family, to be followers. The Bible said, Be ye kind and tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake have forgiven. Be ye followers of God as dear children. The Bible said that you may be blameless and harmless as sons of God without, without rebuke in the midst of a perverse and crooked nation among whom you shine as lights in the world, giving thanks unto the Father which made us to meet to be partakers of the inheritance of light, of the saints in light. The Bible tells us that we are part of the household. We're no more strangers. We're no more foreigners. And we could deal with a lot of different things. And I'm going I'm to get to this part and see if I can, can get where I, my heart can get, get unloaded from this this burden. You've probably not heard of, an, of a man named Spencer Gillis. Anybody know who Spencer Gillis is? I, I didn't expect you to. It's okay. Anybody ever heard of West Point? Spencer Gillis graduated a few weeks ago at West Point. One of the things that the, that the graduating class had to do was to write themselves a letter now that they've been through the four years of West Point. Write yourself a letter that if you knew what you knew now, you would have wished somebody had wrote you a letter when you started. And they would take those letters and give them to the incoming client. And let me just say to you, I think it's still an amazing accomplishment and an honor to get to go one of the, to, to one of the service academies in the United States of America. Whether you go to West Point, whether you go to Annapolis, whether you go to the Air Force Academy, wherever you go, I think it's an amazing, incredible thing. And I, I wish all of our young people would have that opportunity. But if you've been to West Point, you've sat where the greatest generals in the United States, the history of the United States of America have taught and have studied and have, 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 have left with a generation about, about war and about the military service. Can you agree with me? If you've been to West Point, you sat under where the best of the best have taught about military service. Whether you agree with the military, whether you're for the military, that's just where, that's where the best of the best go to teach and go to share and go to train and go to teach others. Here's a young man out of Nevada that gets to go to West Point as an 18-year-old boy. Now he's graduating as a 22-year-old young man, and he's writing, hey, I wish I'd known this. I wish I'd known that. And here's what he says, and I'm going to read you his words, because this, is, this gets to my heart about our church today. 
It says, as graduate, he's writing to himself four years ago, as graduation gets closer, you'll recognize that none of the coursework you completed, the shots you took, or the formations you had matter at all. The greatest leadership lessons will be learned from those around you. And you will love and cherish them for the rest of your life. This is a young man who's graduated after sitting under the teachings of MacArthur and Eisenhower and going all the way back to the lessons all the way back to the Revolutionary War, through the Civil War, lessons that have been etched in stone, so to speak. And this man has been there, and he said, look, when you get to this place in life, what's going to matter the most? It's not the classes you took. It's not how good of a shot you were. He was a rifle major. He, his, his expertise was being able to shoot and hit a target. It's not in the formations you've learned. The greatest help will be to you, those people that have been around you, and the life they've lived, and the leadership lessons they have taught you, those will go with you the rest of your life. You know what I'd say to you today? You're sitting in, in places where some of the greatest Christians have ever sat. You have, you have, you have been, you're walking behind them and beside of them, and if you were smart today, if you were wise today, you would open up your ears and you would learn all you can. You would can all you can and you would put down in your soul and in your heart what you're learning and what you're seeing on a daily basis from God's children. And you'll go out into this world and nothing will help you like what you learn from God's children as they go through life together at a place called church. Amen. I'm telling you here today, you're among some of the greatest Christians. They've been through, they fought some of the greatest battles in life. Battles of home, battles of the mind, battles of the, of the physical need, battles of the flesh. They have been tested in battle. And they have stayed with God. And you and your children and your grandchildren have an opportunity to do just like Spencer Gillis did, to be, uh, have resources that are unmatched among anybody but what's going to make a difference in your life and what you can carry with you through all your days is what you have learned from God's people that you walk through life with at your local church. Now watch this. This hurt me for a long time. I couldn't understand it. But peep, guess what? I read to you. I preached to you a few weeks ago from Timothy. People come and go. Peep, no church stays the same. My, my son used to come home and he, and he would just he would just be in awe a church he grew up in in two years in three years in five years in ten years things change but you know what God being able to help your life doesn't change and just because they don't have the same name and they don't sit on the same pew as what you used to God still puts people in your life and they can plug in and the names are changed but the life experience is the same. And watch people. Miss Sandra came over here uh, from another church that she'd been to through many, many years, raised her children and everything. Else. And you know what she's able to do? She walked into our door and no longer is she going to church with those people she used to go to church with. And all of a sudden, God plugged her into a whole group of people that are still doing the same thing as what God's people have always done. Encourage and help and sustain and support and love and care. And yeah, it's not the same faces, but they're doing the same work. Why? Because church is bigger than people. Church is bigger than individual. Church is the family of God. The whole family on earth is named of Him. And the Lord will plug people in. And you know what? Sometimes He unplugs them. But you know what? It's still church. And He's still going to let church do what it's always done. How many of you, how many of you have been humbled? How many of you have been convicted by, by Brother Henley and Sister Clarissa? They've come in from a different country, a different culture, and, and a whole different environment. They've never been to a Baptist church. And God put them here. And you know what they're doing? They're just plugging right in. How many of you have got a call from Brother Henley? How many of you have got a visit? Somebody want to, them wanting to bring and do. They've called more people in three months' time than probably we have in a whole lifetime. Why? Because they're just doing. They're part of the whole family of God. The whole family in heaven and in earth which is named of God today. I'm just talking to you. We watch it time and again. We talked about Herb and Lou. They came in. Did they seem like strangers? They seem like they'd just only been here a few months. They hit the door and they just kept hitting the door. 
And they kept learning people and loving people and calling people. And yet we come. We come to church. And we're the last ones in and the first ones out. And don't get in the way on the way because I'm in a hurry. And we say, I'm not getting anything from church. You're not giving anything to church. Get in. Spend some time. Learn who's going here. Well, they make the same people. You're right. They're not the same people. But they're God's family. And they've got something to help you with. And as Spencer Gillis said, look, I, I, sat, under, I sat under generals and I, sat, and I studied battle plans and I, I had all this access. But what I found out four years later was what made the difference to me was people living their lives and rubbing off on me. And I want to say to you today, that's still what God's people do at the house of God week after week after week. And Hebrews 10 and verse number 25 says, Forsake not. Forsake not. There's a father in this text. There, there is a family in this text. The Bible teaches us to follow in this text. But the Bible admonishes us not to forsake. Hebrews 10, 25. He said, Let us provoke one another unto love and good work. Provoke one another unto love and good works. I, watch this. You get in church and you get plugged in and you stay plugged in, I'm going to make a prediction. I'm not going to prophesy, but I'm going to make a prediction. You'll be a whole lot more inclined to love and do good works when you're connected with a group of God's people than you will, my friend, out on the lake by yourself drowning worms. Amen? I'm just, I'm just trying to tell you what's on my heart today there's nothing wrong with church church is still the greatest entity on planet earth my friend it is still the vehicle that god chose to get his gospel out to a lost and a dying world church is still doing the greatest work on planet earth it is still telling men and women boys and girls that jesus saves jesus saves jesus saves i'm telling you don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. Study Greek words. Study that word forsake. Don't forsake. That word forsake means to leave in straits. To leave in straits. Do you know what straits are? Trouble. Trouble. Used to be we'd say dire straits. Trouble. Don't leave the church in trouble. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Folks have always laid out of church. Folks have always stayed out of church. Folks have always decided this ain't a good time for church in my life. You didn't come up with that. Your situation is not unique. You're not the only one who's been busy, tired, overwhelmed, or have a lot of toys. It's always been that way. And God said don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But I go back to what Spencer said. I had all kinds of training. I had resources and abounding. But what helped me was becoming part of a family. Becoming part of a group of people and watching their lives. And I'm just here to tell you this morning, I can do nothing for you as a pastor, as a preacher. I've got no gifts. I've got no ability. I've got nothing that's going to make your life better or make you stronger. But if you will rub shoulders week after week after week with God's people and watch them struggle and watch them raise their children and watch them love unconditionally and watch them give faithfully and watch them attend consistently and watch them love and love and love and pray and worship and never quit on God, you will get something that you cannot get anywhere else. You can't go to a school that can teach you that, but you can go to a local church and watch God do it week after week after week. And just like He said, the, great, the best thing out of this was learning and interacting and becoming part of a family. I say to you, if church is just a place you go, you're never letting it become what it could be. It's not a place you go. It is a people you become. It is a people you become. You hurt when they hurt. You weep when they weep. You shout when they shout. You pray when they pray. You, you rejoice when they rejoice. You walk together 
And God said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. How can I be a part of that church, preacher? Because I, I, I don't feel. A church don't mean to me what it means to you. I just suggest to you today, you're not letting it. You're not letting it. You're putting in your time, you're paying the admission fee, and then you, you're scratching it off the list, and it's on to what's next. I just want you to know, if you get hooked into a church, they are what's next. You still have a life, you still have hobbies, you still have family, you still have pleasure, you still have enjoyment. That's, I'm not telling you to live in this parking lot waiting until somebody opens the door again. You just become part of something bigger than you. You're that part that you didn't realize you are that other people depend on, that other people learn from, that other people in, uh, uh, gain from, and you just become that, and God just blesses you. And before you know it, you're integrated. But watch this. God may call you, take you home. Something may happen physically. Something may happen to you a, a dozen different ways. And all of a sudden, you're not there. The work goes on. And God continues to let that person who you thought, it just won't be the same. How many people have we buried in 33 years? We just said it won't be the same. It'll never be the same without them. You ever said that? Ever walked, away from, ever walked out of a church service and found out somebody had passed on? And said it, it'll never be the same. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to keep being part of the family. The whole family. And we're going to keep following Him. And we're going to keep not forsaken. Yeah, days are difficult. It's harder. We're trying to figure out how to have church. We're trying to say, okay, if you're not going to have Sunday night church, how are the kids ever going to sing? When are folks ever going to testify? When are young preachers and house preachers and home preachers, when are they ever going to preach? Uh, uh, when are we ever going to learn a new song in the choir? If we're not going to do Sunday night, when are anything's, any of those things ever going to happen? If we're not going to do Wednesday night, when are we ever going to let our children teach? I learn, hey listen, I'm telling you, our children, we're, they're missing hearing testimonies. They're missing hearing you testify. They need to hear you testify. They're not going to testify if you don't testify. They're going to learn. They're going to learn. They're going to see God touch you. They're going to know when God quakes in their heart and rattles around inside of them that that's what you do. That's how you respond to that. You give God praise. You deal. If you're never in the altar, they're never going to be in the altar. It's not going to happen. I'm telling you, what are we doing? We're, we're part of that family. We're part of that family. That whole family. That whole family. And God can move people from church to church and just keep them plugged in. But watch. A lot of folks are just looking for a real good church to lay out of. We're not it. We're not it. We need everybody that's our church to be here. We depend on you. We need you. We need you to be what God made you to be so that our children can learn about you. But we're, we're trying to figure out, well, we're not going to do this. How, how are these kids going to, how are they ever going to see that? How are they going to have that opportunity? When are they going to ever be standing up and seeing folks uh, uh, and, and, and see the Spirit move and overwhelm? And, and we're, how, we're trying to, we're looking at it, we're trying to say, how can this be done? I just want you to know, it can't. It can't. You can cut all that out, but it can't. So I ask you, I beg you, I implore you, don't forsake. Don't forsake the assembling. Don't forsake the assembling. You say, but preacher, every Sunday we don't shout. Every Sunday we don't run. Every Sunday not every, somebody don't go to the altar. Every Sunday folks don't get saved. I know that. I wish it wasn't that way. But it is that way. But my friend, if you don't come back next Sunday, it sure won't happen then. You just stay at it. You stay at it. And you trust the Lord. They preach, are you preaching today? I don't know, but I sure am unloading a lot of stuff's in my heart. It had just been weighing on me. And when I, heard, I read that young, what that young man said, it just said, I said, that's it. That's it. That's what our church is doing every single day. Every single day. Yes, there's a family. But God puts that family in a local assembly. 
And in that local assembly, you just find those people. And you can say, that. I mean, Nain Brady left out of this world. Dot Brady left out of this world. And, and, and we thought, and people thought, oh, church will never be. And church will never be. It'll never be. It'll never be. Uh, Dr. Moore went home. And, and it'll never be. It'll never be. And yes, people and personalities, they may not be replaced in, in who they are as individuals, but the Lord will replace with the institution. It'll go on. It'll go on. We don't need people's personalities. We need people's, the presence of God in their life however He uses them. He didn't call me to replace somebody else's personality. We're individuals. But the Lord, the Lord makes us what we need to be for somebody else. And you say, preacher, I'm okay. That's great. That's great. But that's just half, that's just half your role. You being okay is fine. But you helping somebody else be okay is even better. And that's what God lets the church do. So preacher, what, what, how, do I, how, do I be, how can I be saved? Y'all be coming with a song. How can I be saved, preacher? If, you, if you're saying I need to be, a, be, be saved, I didn't, de- didn't deal with a lot of things, but I dealt with what I just had to get out off my heart today. How, how, how can I be saved? I, I wrote down some verses I wanted to read before you today. The Scripture tells us, in the Word of God, I just wanted to speak this same idea. For ye are all the children of God. And that funny? That's where the world wants to take that verse. Ye are all the children of God. But they don't want to finish that verse. By faith in Christ Jesus. Yes, we're all God's children. But we're only God's children by faith in Christ Jesus. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth Him, that begat, loveth Him also, that is begotten of Him. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is He that overcometh the world? But He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, I'll be his God. He shall be my son. How to be saved. You're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Who is he that overcometh? He that, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Have you seen a theme in this? You have to believe on Jesus Christ. He has to convict you. He has to convince you. He has to draw you. He has to show you who you are, who He is, what you need, what He can do. But then at that point, He that believeth, as many as received Him, to them gave He power. You must, you must, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart, thou shalt be saved. Confess what? That you're a sinner? Sure. But it's not just confessing that you're a sinner. It's confessing that He's the Savior. Confessing that He's the Savior. Saying what He said is what the word confess means. Saying what He said. Saying the same thing. He says we're sinners. He said He's the Savior. He said He'll save us if we'll confess Him. While you're standing today, I know it's scattered. I know it's mild. It's, 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 it's rapid fire. But oh my, thank the Lord for the family. Thank the Lord for Sunday school classes that are writing down what the Word of God says. That the old preacher can just read and read what they said and let God speak to his heart. I just want you to know today, if you're part of the church, don't forsake. Don't forsake others. Don't leave in dire straits. Don't leave in hardship. Well, but, but, but you don't know right now. Right now. We're depending on folks that are, that are, that are doing all they can do. And, and, and they're beyond that. We need somebody to come behind them and say, let me spell you a little bit. Let me take some of that load. Let me help Brother Larry Elrod. Let me help Brother Wayne Sosby. Let me help these men that are, that are, that are dealing with the end of life issues with family members and other things in their life. Let me step in beside them. I can't do all they can do, but I can, I can be like Aaron and her. I can 
hold their hands up. I can stand beside of them and, and raise their hands and, and take some of the load off. The ladies the same way. They're doing so much. We, we can't just say, y'all keep at it. Y'all stay at it. I appreciate it. Because when I'm here, I want it to be good. I want it to be rich. I want it to be sweet. We need you. We need you. We need you. Help us in these things. If you've never been saved, that's where it starts. Would you come to Him today? The whole family. The whole family in heaven and in earth. And you're not part of that, but you can be. You can be. We are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Would you put your faith in Him while they sing? Would you come? Would you come?